Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll just give everyone a few seconds. We know that it takes a little while for you to connect. So uh, we'll start in just another 10 or 15 seconds. Thank you in advance for holding. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We have a few housekeeping items before we start today's program. I'm Andrea Jensen. I'm the education specialist for Allergy and Asthma Network, and I'm a certified asthma educator. All participants will be on mute for the webinar. We will record today's webinar and post it on our website within a few days. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. Scroll to the bottom of the page to find our recorded webinars and any upcoming webinars. This webinar will be one hour and we will include time for questions. We'll take those questions at the end of the webinar, but you can put them in the Q&A tab at any time. Sometimes I'll miss questions if people put them in the chat, so please remember to put them in the Q&A, which is in the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We have someone monitoring the chat if you have questions or need help. We will get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. We do offer CEUs and CMEs for this webinar. This webinar series is Advances in Allergy and Asthma in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Allergy and Asthma Network offers CNEs for nurses and CRCEs for respiratory therapists. The American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology offers CMEs. A few days after the webinar, so please be patient, you will receive an email from Zoom with resources from the webinar, also a link to access continuing education credits. You will also have a link to a certificate of attendance. We will also put that certificate in the chat. So today we're going to talk about how asthma is impacted by allergies and asthma. Allergy and Asthma Network is a grassroots organization that was started over 35 years ago by a mom who knew that other mothers like her needed resources and support. Our mission is to end the needless death and suffering due to allergies, asthma, and related conditions through outreach, education, advocacy, and research. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lorenis Linneman. She received her MD cum laude in 1992 at the Rijksuniversiteit Utrecht, which is probably not the right pronunciation, <laughs> in the Netherlands. In 1995, she received her title as pediatrician and in 1997 as pediatric allergist at the National Institute of Pediatrics in Mexico City, Mexico. She's been working in private practice since 2001. That same year, she founded the Pro Bono Allergy Clinic in Pueblo Cuito. In March 2017, she was appointed director of the Center of Excellence in Asthma and Allergy at the Hospital Medica Sur in Mexico City. Dr. Lorenis Lineman is an internationally well-known and highly regarded expert in the field of allergy. Her special fields of interest are asthma, allergen immunotherapy, allergic rhinitis, and urticaria. She is a national advocate to GINA in 2020 up until now, the ARIA County, or excuse me, Country Coordinator for Mexico that started in 2012 and is current, and coordinated the National ARIA Mexico 2014 document. She chairs the National Urticaria Guidelines uh, in late 2014. This resulted in over 90,000 downloads. In 2016, her center became the Center of Excellence UCARE. She also created part of the Global Expert Panel for the update of urticaria guidelines in 2017. In April 2017, the Mexican Guideline on Asthma was published under her leadership, co-authored by 58 experts from 12 national societies. Its content forms the basis for CME on asthma, Cena Prise, C E N A. PRCE from the Ministry of Health. Since January 2019, she chairs the International Severe Asthma Registry, which is ISAR in Mexico. She co-chaired the Mexican Consensus on Atopic Dermatitis, which ended in 2018, and chaired in the 2019 renewal of the Mexican Guidelines on Immunotherapy. 
Dr. Larayna Sniniman has lectured at the National Allergy Congresses, at the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immuno Immunology, and the EAACI Annual Conference, which is a global conference, and the World Allergy Conference Congress. Dr. Larena Sniniman has published over 150 articles in peer-reviewed journals, written various book chapters, and is a reviewer of seven journals. She became a member of the National Systems of Investigators Level 2 in January of 2016. Whew! <laughs> yes, everyone sorry. Was correct in that. No, 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 that wonderful work, and we are so grateful to have you here today. Um, if there's anything in there that was incorrect, please feel free to correct it, or otherwise, you can go ahead and continue your slides. No, it's all okay, Andrea. That, that was that was like two, three years back. I, I have now over 210 publications, but it's it's all super. Thank you so much for such a sweet introduction. And yeah, it's an absolute honor, uh, definitely for me here, sitting in my uh, office in Mexico City to be able to uh, work uh, on this webinar together with you. So let's get started. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, I've received several grants for the now nine national guidelines I've chaired. Um, we'll speak a little bit further on that uh, more down the road. And yeah, sure, I'm speaker of several uh, pharmaceutical industries. Um, the learning objectives for today are to discuss the place of allergen therapy in asthma guidelines, to be acquainted with results for more recent allergen therapy in asthma trials. And I'd like to specifically focus here on the real world evidence. And then, yeah, sure, at the very end, it's very important, I think, to select the correct patient with the correct allergen and the correct timing of when to start allergen immunotherapy in asthma. So you really can give the benefit to the patients with allergic asthma. Well, uh, yeah, so these are the guidelines I chaired um, and one of them co-chaired, there was the, the consensus. But yeah, as you can see, this was 2019, the allergen immunotherapy one, and very recently, 2021, at the end of the, the year, actually the, the asthma one, the latest asthma one that now has just yesterday checked over 45,000 downloads. So we're really happy. We really are able to reach uh, quite a lot of colleagues, probably with the guidelines. So that's uh, the fusion of those two is, uh, well, the, the subject of my talk today with you. So at this moment, allergen therapy and asthma guidelines, that's what we're going to check. Um, evidence for allergen therapy, double length placebo controlled. I'd like to um, show you one of the very earliest trials, um, now more than 50 years back, of allergen therapy and asthma. Um, and, and still have a quick look at it. And, and finally, yeah, as I told you already, real world evidence, we look a little bit also at meta analysis, et cetera. Um, then, well, what are the critical issues? No, uh, what about the allergic asthma and what about severe asthma? And well, well for the future, which place we would like to have um, asthma um, have in, in allergen therapy guidelines and vice versa, allergen therapy in the asthma guidelines. Yeah, first, um, I bumped into this uh, quite recent article you now where it is explained um, why there might be still a, a problem and still a little bit of a holdback of regulators to really um, approve asthma as an indication for allergen immunotherapy. Well, uh, essential for, for uh, licensure, um, they say that the allergen immunotherapy product has to remain comparable uh, in quality and quantitative composition throughout the whole clinical development. And I think the most important part maybe is the verification of efficacy really now showing to be of clinical relevance. And that sometimes is, is slippery. What is of clinical relevance to one um, is not so much to the other and vice versa. Well, then speaking about clinical relevance, I think when we, when we uh, thought very deeply on this with uh, some colleagues who helped me with the development of the asthma guidelines uh, two years back. We said, well, what would be the main goals of asthma treatment? What do we really want to accomplish with uh, the, the um, comprehensive management of asthma in our patients? Well, number one, sure, avoid deaths. Yeah, but I think it's oftentimes it's, it's just overlooked, but this is finally the most important point. And then let me remind you that daily, and these are data just coming out of the Global Asthma Network report, um, daily in US, there are 10 deaths by asthma in US. 
This is, um, if I speak by heart, it's, it's, I think it's 1.2 per 100,000 inhabitants. In UK, it's even a little bit worse. It's 1.4. And in Australia, it was, I think, a 0.9 per 100,000 inhabitants. So it's really still absolutely up to date, avoid asthma deaths because they're still happening way, way, way too much. Well, um, avoiding saba monotherapy at any level and early starting uh, with corticosteroid, inhaled corticosteroid to really uh, get down the inflammation might be very important uh, factors linked to trying to avoid asthma deaths. Then trying to avoid lung function on the long term. Well, here, this is directly linked to uh, the quantity of severe exacerbations of asthma crisis that a patient has in his lifetime. Every crisis leaves a little scar, a little scar. So it's also very important to try to avoid severe exacerbations. And then finally, and there is a discussion, I think it definitely also is very important to reduce the side effects of medication. So always to try to keep as low as possible inhaled corticosteroid doses. So those are the outcomes we would have to look for when we look for the trials and, and see how really yes or no important they are. Well, what do the guidelines say at this very moment? And I'd like to review with you those five guidelines. And sure, I'll start with Gina. You know, with Gina, we know it's not really a guideline. It's, an, it's a strategy for asthma management, as now Gina officially put also on uh, the very first page. Um, so we can't compare it with the the the... the um, the, the quality that a guideline has to have because it's updated every year, every year. So it uh, might not have the super solid quality um, of evidence review that the guidelines has. The good thing of GINA, it's very updated. Now, and this is uh, the 2023 slide of the, the two tracks of therapy. Um, and we can see that here down on the figure is this gray box. And here we can see that already from 2022 onwards, GINA is now uh, approving allergen immunotherapy. Still in the figure, it's only mentioned houses might sublingual allergen immunotherapy in step two, three, and four um, of the asthma therapy. And if we look at the text in GINA 2023, well, then it mentions also subcutaneous allergen immunotherapy. It states that there are a few studies comparing skid to slit against pharmacotherapy. Uh, there's a reduction in asthma symptoms and medication. Uh, houses might and grass pollen specifically are those allergens that have the best evidence, but there's insufficient evidence for molds. As for sublingual, um, Gina states that there's modest evidence in reducing inhaled corticosteroid dose, um, reduced time to the first exacerbation in suboptimally controlled asthmatic adults because the trial was lowering inhaled corticosteroid and then see how many patients were uh, getting an exacerbation. So this is like a little bit forced exacerbation and that's why uh, Gina was a bit reluctant to really put this in um, in the figure. Now, finally, they, they, they agreed with this. Now, and there's a concern uh, about the trial designs uh, specifically of the more earlier sublingual allergen immunotherapy trials. Then they advise, you know, um, for skid potential benefits but always to weigh against the risks um, inconvenience of having to go every time to the office to get the shots and the costs. And uh, for the sublingual, they say consider adding in symptomatic, interesting, symptomatic houses might sensitive adults with allergic rhinitis uncontrolled despite inhaled corticosteroids, so symptomatic asthmatics, um, but when the FEV1 is over 70%. And currently they're uh, reviewing in depth. I asked them to put me on the, uh, the committee that is reviewing. Um, uh, I was not accepted to be on that committee. So I really hope that there are allergists and not only pneumologists on a committee of Gina now reviewing um, allergen therapy for asthma. For the children, and this is uh, the figure from 2022, it's exactly the same thing for uh, 2023 as for allergen immunotherapy, no indication in children. That's Gina. Now let's go to uh, the asthma man man management guidelines. Now the, 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 the US, um, the NAP. Well, NAP here on the bottom of the figure, we will blow it up a little bit, says for step two to four, so it's the same as in Gina, conditionally recommend the use of subcutaneous immunotherapy as an adjunct treatment to standard pharmacotherapy. 
five years and up. So they do allow, NAB does allow allergen immunotherapy in children and whose asthma is controlled. Exactly the opposite as what Gina says, if they're not controlled at um, initiation, build up and maintenance. So the patient has to be on controlled allergy of asthma to be able to start and continue allergen immunotherapy. And if you look at the tables of uh, the evidence, um, here we see the immunotherapy part of the tables, uh, the different numbers of the recommendations. And so for um, individuals ages five years and older with mild to moderate allergic asthma, the expert panel recommends um, conditionally recommends subcutaneous allergen immunotherapy as opposed to Gina that more uh, goes in favor of the sublingual, only has sublingual allergen immunotherapy in the figure. Um, interestingly, uh, the NIAP goes against, um, there's a conditional recommendation against sublingual allergen immunotherapy. It's still conditional and there's moderate level of evidence because I said there's not enough evidence to really support this. Well, I think the good part of the NIPE is the very solid review of evidence. The very bad part is that as it's so solid and it went through so many rounds of reviews and reviews and reviews, the evidence was only up to date till October 2018. So everything that has been published over the last almost five years is not taken into account in the NIPE recommendations. Um, the Spanish colleagues, what do the Spanish colleagues say? This is their uh, treatment algorithm. And as we can see in their text, um, they say that subcutaneous allergen immunotherapy is effective for allergic asthma when it's well controlled. And this is level A of evidence. Um, um, they can even uh, start already since, since Escalon 1, uh, step one from the therapy, uh, from asthma therapy, especially, especially if there's concomitant allergic rhinitis. So they don't withhold allergen immunotherapy till step two. They really uh, make it possible already from step one onward to start allergen immunotherapy, not in uncontrolled severe asthma. And here the level of evidence is B. As for sublingual, they also state level of evidence B is a little bit less. And um, well, here it's the only guideline that clearly states, because there's quite a lot of allergists on this guideline, that it also should be taken into account that allergen immunotherapy has the long-term benefit of clinical um, improvement even years after uh, stopping the therapy. So I think this is a special extra uh, benefit that other guidelines haven't taken into account. Again, I think it's very important that on the, 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 the teams, the review, that there are allergists, as in the NIAB, yes, there were quite a lot of colleagues there. So what does the BTS sign? Uh, BTS sign is, is also still a little bit old document from four years back. And they state that probably in a year from now, uh, uh, 31st of July, 2024, they hope to have an updated version. So I still have to show you here the 2019 version. Um, here they already uh, made very clear that for subcutaneous allergen therapy, there's uh, one, two plus high level evidence, Cochrane reviews of um, evidence of um, benefit of allergen therapy in asthma to reduce the symptoms and medication improve uh, bronchial hyperreactivity. Um, sure, there's also uh, one double plus uh, evidence for adverse reactions. But as you know, in UK, allergen immunotherapy is only licensed for allergic rhinitis. So uh, they can't come up with any recommendation. Very the same for sublingual. There's good level of evidence. Um, serious adverse events are very rare here. So the, the safety for sublingual sure is much higher. But again, it's not licensed for asthma. Then we go to the last guideline, and sure, I, I couldn't leave it out. This is our guideline, no, the MIA, Manejo Integral del Asma. And we have this very interesting, I think, uh, therapy figure as we figured out that what, what you give as maintenance on that, it depends what would be the best rescue therapy. So we made these little blocks together with the maintenance and the rescue. Just a little interesting thing, maybe. Well, here on the um, right-hand side of our uh, treatment figure, you can see that an allergic asthma, step two to step four, allergen immunotherapy. This is the algorithm for 12 years up. And we do allow also allergen immunotherapy in the children. On your right-hand side, you can see four 
to 11 years, uh, the figure for the kids. Yeah, I'd like to, to add a, a little bit of some figures of um, well, pictures we took in tequila. I think you all know tequila, the, the very well-known uh, alcoholic drink here in Mexico. Well, we went there and, and we launched uh, just very recently uh, a topic dermatitis guideline. But then we made nice pictures. We, we, we were sleeping in this hotel that was, or that was of, I don't know how you call them, these round things, uh, wooden things in which they keep tequila. So it was, it was quite nice. So yeah. It's some nice pictures. Well, what's the evidence um, for double-blind PC control trials? And he will take you back to this publication from the early 16s from Johnston and his group. Um, well, this was not a nice trial in the sense that ethically it was absolutely flawed. Nobody knew that they were part of a clinical trial. The strong point I think here is that exactly as nobody knew they were part of a clinical trial, so um, the bias of being part of a clinical trial was not there because they didn't even know they were on a clinical trial. All children that arrived to the department with asthma, so there was no informed consent, nor the kids, nor the parents knew they were on a trial, and they all received, all the children received subcutaneous allergen and therapy until their, fifth, their 15th birthday. And they were randomly assigned to four groups. Um, uh, that was surely the, the high dose group, you know, the highest tolerated group. So they really pushed up to the highest dose that the kids would tolerate. I think that might be more or less what we now practice as good allergen and therapy. Then there was the placebo, the control group, and also the kind of placebo. This was a uh, hundred thousand times, no, even more, uh, uh, more than a million times diluted uh, extract. So this is also control group. And then there was in between. And then if we look at the outcomes, there were several um, outcomes in this publication. I, I put here the slides of the original, you know, uh, pictures of the original publication. Um, if we look at um, the kids that had as many or more asthma attacks as the previous year, in the high dose group, there was none of them anymore. And if we look at no severe exacerbations the whole last year, not even severe exacerbations, there were hardly any in the highest dose group, as completely opposite in the control groups, where there was still well, almost uh, here, 90%, maybe 70% still having severe exacerbations the last year. And the in-between group was in-between with the numbers. Misfortunately, um, some 30 years after that, the Atkinson trial really pushed allergen therapy as being um, uh, able to benefit in asthma way back. With this trial, this was a one and a half year trial, double blind pc controlled randomized controlled trial with 121 children with moderate to severe asthma and perennial symptoms. And here is uh, the figure at randomization. And you can see that one and a half year later, you now the black dots are the allergen and therapy kits and the open dots are the placebo kits. There is no difference at all uh, between uh, both groups as for medication score um, the last days. What are maybe the flaws in this trial? Why was it completely negative? Well, I think there's several. First, the median number of extracts. Yeah, I know that you still in US do mix quite a lot of allergens together. After the Amar trial from the Hal Nelson group uh, for sublingual allergen therapy, where we saw that if you have one allergen and the rest is only a diluent, or if you do one allergen and then uh, many other allergens that not cross-react and do not have nothing to do with the allergy of the patient, you add them to the vial, then the vial becomes much less effective. Um, I do think this also applies for allergen, subcutaneous allergen immunotherapy. So uh, I think definitely six is probably a bit too many allergens. But more importantly, we all know we do not have to mix highly uh, high content protease allergens, which are cockroach and molds. Here there was two thirds of the kids who received mold mixed within the mix of the vial. So this probably reduced severely the, the, the potency of the vials as it uh, degrades almost all pollens, at least. And then if we look at the houses mite, well, the houses mite that they added were still from houses mite extracts made from 
whole mite cultures. A whole mite culture has a very high quantity of derpy one, you know, because uh, it's fecal particles. Now, so in the whole mite culture, this is the mites and all the, the, the stuff they are growing in. Well, there's a high level of derpy one, but the derpy two content is almost 10 times less. Nowadays, the nice allergen immunotherapy houses mite extracts you have there all in US are highly uh, high quantity allergen excess because they just have as many, um, just have as much derpy one as derpy two in them. Um, we did the trials and and we did the 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 laboratory testing um, with the support of ALK Greer and 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 Halsestier and even the FDA. So if you want to look those publications up, but and nowadays you have very good high quality extracts as for houses mites. What was not the case in those used in this trial. So I think those flaws probably uh, made the trial coming out negative. Then. Um, 20 years later, almost 20 years later, finally, you now Christian Virchow um, uh, with the group from ALK was able to show that here it is houses mites sublingual uh, allergen therapy tablets that if you put the patients on houses mites sublingual allergen therapy just for house, houses mites um, and you start after several months a reduction, you know, a 50% reduction here in the phase 3A of the inhaled corticosteroids uh, that maintain the patients under control. And in the phase 3B, you even withdraw completely inhaled corticosteroids. Then you see surely uh, allergen, uh, the asthmatic patients starting to get exacerbations, severe exacerbations. But this was very clearly less in the two active groups as compared to the placebo. So here they very clearly showed that allergen immunotherapy partly protects against severe exacerbations, even in an inhaled corticosteroid withdrawal um, schedule. Sure, here Gina attacks the, the, the clinical trial because I say this is not a well-controlled uh, asthmatic patient. You should not withdraw the inhaled corticosteroid. Mm. Well, we can discuss about that. Then um, now I'd like to go a little bit further on to real world evidence trials. And um, I first did a small trial, a relatively small trial from Korea, but I think it was interesting because they really neatly gave the three years. Now I think it always, if you do an allergen immunotherapy trial, at least you have to cover the two, but preferably the three years. We know this takes a while until really the good effect kicks in. So here was a good, nice three-year trial. Um, there were even uh, quite a high group of uh, uh, Korean patients that were able to completely discontinue inhaled corticosteroids, uh, two-thirds of them as opposed to a very low number uh, percentage in the non-allergen immunotherapy group and a reduction in almost all of the others. So um, there were able either to reduce or completely withdraw in corticosteroid after the three years of allergen immunotherapy. And here they compared, I think it's very interesting, the, the only houses might or the multi-allergen, although this was not a super multi-allergen, but you can see that uh, even mixes did quite good. Now, um, in, in in maybe it, it, yeah in in the different years of the trial uh, we can see there's no difference if it was monoallergen immunotherapy in monosensitized patients or multiallergen immunotherapy in multisensitized patients and um maybe here this interesting point which patients did better and statistically significantly better uh, at least here and here there's a, a very strong trend well those who had asthma um with a more early onset now, um, in the responders, there were a little bit uh, younger people and a bit older in the non-responders. We always know more younger asthma starts. It's more probably, it's really allergic asthma. And sure, those who had allergic rhinitis as comorbidity, they did better than in those who did not have allergic rhinitis as comorbidity. Then here, now, these are uh, the really large database studies, which is very much in vogue um, over the last couple of years. Um, we can see here a large database in France uh, by De Villiers. It was published four years back in Allergy. And we can see here the Suppling Allergen Therapy Group was able to reduce a 40% symptomatic asthma medication while the matched 
um, control group, here's the open control, here's the match control group, there was an, uh, uh, a rise of 10% in asthma medication. And um, then um, three years later, Vogelberg, there were several other trials open, database trials. Uh, in total, there were eight uh, actually. So Vogelberg decided to do uh, a meta-analysis um, actually of 13 um, uh, real world evidence trials and database trials. And there they concluded that it was not very clear. There were several trials that showed a very nice effect as you can see on the left hand side, but there were also some three, four trials that did not show any effect at all. So they concluded that we cannot straight onward say that allergenic therapy really works in asthma. Results seemed so a little bit conflicting, but then um, we had after that, um, no, one of those the, the trials was really this one, which I think is quite solid. This is a database from Germany, and they showed now that there were allergen therapy patients and non-allergen therapy patients, 4,000 and 35,000, and they checked those who were treating um, themselves with a GINA step one, step two, three, or step four. And they checked this after um, the time of allergen therapy, and they saw that those being on allergen therapy had a 13% reduction of a chance that they would on, go on from stage one to stage three. And there was even a 34% reduction um, of the risk of going on from, from being stage three GINA on becoming stage four GINA as compared to those who were not on allergen immunotherapy. And here it was very clear that the children had even a stronger um, positive effect as opposed to adults. I think in general, we know that allergen immunotherapy is normally um, tending to be more effective the earlier we start. The children do frequently better than the adults. At least that's what I see here as a pediatric allergist. And then uh, I think this is, is um, uh, yeah, well, the, the best um, evidence for me coming from real world evidence. This was published after the meta analysis of Vogelberg, um, Celeste. Um, uh, from, from Denmark to, together with Benedict uh, Fritschi. Um, this was a retrospective cohort study. It was published in the Lancet Regional Health. Um, it was from 2007 to 2017. They reviewed uh, almost, almost 50,000 uh, um, allergen immunotherapy treated subjects. So it's a really big database. You know, Danish, it's, it's all uh, registered there. So you can do all those registries very nicely. Um, everything that you buy in the pharmacy is, is registered on your name. So you can really do the follow up for many years. Years. And uh, here there was a clear reduction in the use of corticosteroids of a 34%, um, and also of the moderate uh, to severe asthma exacerbations. And if we look here at the figures, um, here they've followed up the patients for one, two, three, la la la, la nine years. And uh, after a really long follow up, even after finishing allergen therapy, we can see a very clear, specifically those last four or five years, very clear movement uh, of um, reduced asthma treatment, now more step down in asthma treatment, less severe exacerbations, and less hospitalizations, as you can see on the right hand panel. So I think this is quite strong real world evidence of the effect that the benefit of allergen therapy in asthma on the long run. Then um, systematic reviews. Well, uh, these are a bit older now, 2010. Here, the Abramson, um, Abramson which still uh, is, is the one uh, that gives the evidence to many of the guidelines. Gina didn't like it because I said it was way too much home, uh, heterogeneous in the different allergens, the different doses, the different outcomes. So they didn't take this one into account. Other guidelines did. Um, you can see here that the, the vast majority were houses might uh, trials, but there was also pollen ones, uh, animal ones. There was only two of Clavisporium, so that's why we say, well, the, the, the evidence 
for mold is very low. But uh, Abramson already in 2010 showed that there was the numbers needed to treat to um, reduce the deterioration, you know, the risk of deterioration of asthma symptoms uh, with immunotherapy, you no know, numbers needed to treat of four, and that also asthma medication, you now you see the reduction in asthma medication is this whole yellow group. And again, here is numbers needed to treat four. So this is really quite strong um, effect uh, in benefit of the allergen immunotherapy treated asthma group. Then uh, the Cochrane analysis for sublingual, specifically here in pediatric asthma. Um, yeah, Martin Penagos, uh, one of my Mexican colleagues working with uh, Professor Durham at Imperial College since uh, I think more than a decade back now. Martin in um, 2008 published in Chest. Um, as you can see, quite a nice positive effect here for symptom score and also a very clear and strong effect for reduction in medication. The flaw maybe of these meta-analysis, both of them, is the very high heterogeneity again of uh, of the trials. Now, uh, over 75% is high heterogeneity. Here we have 94% and here we have 95% of heterogeneity. And specifically, we know that the early sublingual allergen immunotherapy trials were very heterogeneous in many aspects. So, and yeah, the number total number of, of patients was low. Um, then, um, yeah, these were the, the this is the, the latest one published by Rice, uh, now a little bit over five years back in pediatrics. Here they have already now 40 studies and uh, Rice and colleagues concluded with this latest systematic, re systematic review of allergen therapy in pediatric asthma, that there's moderate strengths of evidence for sub-Q and especially also on the long-term uh, reduction of asthma, asthma medication. And there's low strength evidence for sublingual. And um, also a very strong group reviewing with uh, a lot of help of methodologists was the IACI guidelines on allergen immunotherapy. Um, I was happy to be part of the, this big group. There we had like seven different subgroups. One did allergen immunotherapy for allergic rhinitis, allergen immunotherapy for asthma, allergen immunotherapy for vitamin therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the group that uh, was looking more specifically on uh, into allergic asthma, and here was how does my driven allergic asthma, and um, there was a meta-analysis done, and then based on those meta-analysis, the guidelines came out, and um, here they recommended this add-on to regular asthma therapy in adults with house mite allergic asthma, partly controlled, um, and this is a conditional recommendation with moderate quality of evidence, and um, uh, house mite skits, um, in adults and children and slit, liquid slit in children. And again, as add-on, I think this is also very important, as add-on medication is not the sole medication, but it starts on as add-on medication for allergic asthma patients. So yeah, to come to these conclusions in the guidelines, they were really solidly informed by systematic reviews done three years earlier. Sure, we always have to speak about safety, you know, especially if you speak about allergen therapy and asthma. And uh, I'd like to uh, draw your attention here again to a publication that we did um, in Allergy Asthma Proceedings in 2016. Um, here we, we sent a survey out, and it was pre uh, Pre uh, pandemic, so the people still quite good replied to surveys. We're now in, uh, I think we got an ocean of, <laughs> of, of surveys, so it's really hard to get good replies back. But in, in those days, we got over a thousand of you responding us back. And we asked about well, do you give allergen immunotherapy in patients with a pregnancy? when they're already pregnant, so they continue in hypertension, in cancer, in remission, in autoimmune diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And among those many questions we also ask about, sorry, this has gone one to the right, it's here, the severe asthma. Now, the severe asthma patients, um, up to two thirds of you told us, yes, I'm treating patients or I would treat, and only a third said no. Allergen immunotherapy is contraindicated in severe asthma. We're not speaking here about control. We're speaking about the severity. 
And then we asked the, uh, the, 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 the physicians, the colleagues, well, uh, in total, more or less, how many patients did you treat with this condition? And you can see here that um, the severe asthma, it's um, over 3,500 patients in total. If you summed up all the different colleagues that replied, um, in total over uh, 3,500 patients with severe asthma that had been treated in those days, this is uh, 2016, um, with allergen immunotherapy. And then the last question was, well, if you treated the patient with allergen immunotherapy, did you bump into major problems or minor problems or no problems at all? And then we, again, we asked of all the different um, uh, diseases, conditions that uh, physician treated patients with. And you can see here that the number one with, yes, definitely, we have um, a 12.5% of major problems was in the severe asthma patients. So sure, this is uh, probably, this is, this is pre-biologics now. This is still, um, uh, 20, 2016 um, was this published, so it's a pre-biologic era, but really with severe asthma and allergen immunotherapy, this is a major uh, caveat, be very careful there. And then, yeah, um, the last slides on, on uh, safety sure have to come from the, those wonderful surveillance studies um, David Bernstein started now almost a decade ago with a very strong help. And now it's almost being taken over by Tolly Epstein. You now he still continues these. Um, yeah, this is this is uh, 2008 that they started. I think it's wonderful data and so illustrative for us. Um, what are the problems? What are the main issues with? even uh, deaths in allergen immunotherapy. Um, and the latest publication is this one. Now we had, <laughs> the little thing went, went down. We had 35 uh, fatalities in the old days, uh, 41 still in the old days, the, the, the previous millennium. Uh, fortunately, with all uh, more safety issues being well in place, the 30 minute waiting period and uh, not giving shots when the patients are uncontrolled, uh, lowering when they're in the peak season, et cetera, et cetera, those death rates, seem to go nicely down until now uh, the last report um, um, here in 2015 to 2018, five and misfortunately 2018 to 2023, 11 new cases of fatalities. So we're still not doing so well there. And then if we looked, um, those were the five patients I'm reviewing here for you now, one by one. Now in the publications of Tolly, uh, she comes up with all the detailed descriptions of the patients. And um, I put here some three or four of them up for you. They all had involved asthma. Um, there was a wheezing in the reaction. Here you can see severe asthma, hospitalizations, um, and again, here, there's a low FEV1, so um, it's still uh, of high risk giving allergen immunotherapy in uncontrolled or in severe asthmatic patients if they're not under good control. These are the fatalities, surely, with sublingual allergen immunotherapy. Now, um, it's probably a little bit slower in its onset of action, in its complete onset of action. At least I always tell my patients, I will will not tell you if you're doing well or if you're doing bad with your uh, sublingual allergen therapy until we have one year of giving the drops. If we do still drops here, we don't have tablets, but um, but sure, yeah, the safety part is, is wonderful. No, no fatalities at all till now. And yeah, um, some of the interesting remarks, surely I can't leave behind is on the prevention of asthma. Now, not for treating asthma, but for preventing asthma in patients who only have allergic uh, rhinitis. We all know the PET trials now, uh, Lars Jacobson um, working very closely and being uh, even employed by LK and uh, later being uh, working on his own. He did a very nice, um, this was open trial, but a very nice follow-up after giving three years of subcutaneous allergen therapy to children with only allergic rhinitis at enrollment, well, at the end of allergen therapy, they were checked how much asthma symptoms and medication was there after five years or 
two years after finishing allergen therapy and after 10 years, or this was seven years after finishing allergen therapy. This was presented in Paris in 2003 as a poster, and this was really a solid publication in allergy in 2007. And so if we look at how did it after three years allergen therapy, those who had no asthma and those who had asthma in red, there is a very clear difference. This allergen therapy, subcutaneous allergen therapy group as compared to the controls, open controls, um, are two years more, you know, two years after finishing allergen therapy, this still holds on very clearly. And um, even seven years after finishing allergen therapy, we can clearly see now the percentage of uh, patients with only in the control group having asthma and those who had allergen therapy for three years. And the odds ratios are really clearly um, significant. This was high dose subcutaneous allergen therapy, um, mostly with uh, houses mite or with pollens. Then was a sublingual uh, trial done by Erika Valaverta. This was really a pan-European study, 11 different countries, 101 sites, 812 children. You can see here all the different countries participating. And um, this was given a sublingual allergen therapy for three years, and then they gave two years of follow-up. Um, here you can see, interestingly, uh, how the kids, um, this was with uh, uh, grass pollen tablets, now how the children, um, after one year with the tablet, they still had a little bit more symptoms, asthma symptoms during the winter. You're sure the winter is not the pollen season. So those kids had a tendency to have more asthma those in the active group. But after the three years, and I already told you, this is, takes time until it really kicks in. After the three years, there you can see that even without, uh, no, outside the, the pollen season or in the winter months, the asthma symptoms are very clearly less in the active group as compared to the placebo group. And this still went on. I can't go more over there with my cursor, but here in the two years of follow-up. In the seasonal months, now in the summer months during the pollen season, right from the start, we see this very nice reduction and it still holds on uh, also the two years of follow-up. Then this was supposedly a negative trial as the, the solids um, primary efficacy outcome was a very stringent uh, um, definition um, of symptoms and uh, uh, spirometry and, and medications that had to go down. And, and um, so the primary efficacy value, um, outcome was not met in this trial, but I think we can all very clearly see that asthma symptoms reduced, asthma medication reduced, symptom and medication together reduced, if you do symptom and medication and uh, spirometry together, it still is statistically significant how it reduced. And um, also, if we look at um, the, the, the um, uh, inhaled corticosteroid doses, still statistically significant reduction um, in the active group. But the primary efficacy uh, variable was not met. So I think, yeah, although this again officially is a negative trial, I think it is very clearly showing us that there is, uh, oh, sorry, this is a bit neater uh, picture. <laughs> there is a, a clear um, um, tendency to uh, to reduce the uh, going on to asthma in children with only allergic rhinitis, also with sublingual allergen immunotherapy here, it was with grass. Summing up now, um, Vision that allergy, allergen immunotherapy is a disease modifying therapy. I think this vision is very important and should be taken into account if a guideline developers are arguing and discussing if allergen immunotherapy should have a place in asthma guidelines for allergic asthma. And I think that is the important thing. Um, allergen immunotherapy. Um, in asthma, only if it's allergic asthma, 
um, if there's better results, yeah, there's better results in children. So I will not leave the children out. I don't like Gina leaves them out. I think there is evidence in children as well. And we all know that children respond normally better than adults. If there is comorbid allergic rhinitis, I think that's an important point as well. And I think there's evidence for the efficacy, both skid and slit. Um, sure, if you look, only look at the old slit trials, there were uh, quite a lot of heterogeneity. There's not so much uh, solid trials, but the later trials are, are quite solid. And um, yeah, sure, subcutaneous allergenomal therapy, always the part of the, the safety. Really, this should only be administered uh, strictly by us experts and uh, in the office of the treating physician with a 30 minute waiting period. Absolutely. Um, then I do not have a slide on severe asthma. And um, there I would only like to share my thoughts. Here is not solid evidence behind this yet. Um, but my thoughts are that now in the biologic era, and what we've been living through here in my um, my office is that once a patient is a uh, severe asthmatic patient, severe allergic asthmatic patients, we do the houses, uh, the we do the skin testing surely before we put them on the biologic. Now we have the complete workout before we put them on the biologic. If they really allergic asthma and flare when they are exposed to the allergen with asthma symptoms, once we have them for six year, uh, months on the biologic, we do start allergen therapy. And I normally start with sublingual at least the first year um, and eventually then go on uh, with sub-Q, but having the patient well-controlled on a biologic therapy. And I think um, as a biologic is not a disease modifier, um, I do think that allergen therapy can add on there, but sure, uh, good solid trials are needed uh, in this era. And um, I think about this is, is, is one of the, the open questions for all of us. And I definitely think we should explore it. Yeah, then um, giving thanks to all the big groups of colleagues, the, the core groups of the guidelines. And every guideline has also a large guideline development group uh, from 9, 10, 11 different societies collaborating with us, uh, summing up to a total of normally 40, 50 colleagues working on guidelines. Uh, but I'd like to he show you a little bit the faces of our allergen immunotherapy GIMIT, now guideline Guia Mexicana, the immunotherapia of our Guia Mex, now of der uh, topic dermatitis here with dermatologists on the guideline group, uh, the MIA, which was was the asthma guideline 2021 and the old asthma guideline from 2017. Uh, um, this is where I originally come from. So I'm not Mexican. Uh, I'm not US neither. So I do have my English and Spanish accent. I'm Dutch. But this here, Rijks Universiteit Utrecht, as Andrea already uh, told you, I then did my pediatrics and uh, pediatric allergies degree in the UNAM here in Mexico City. And I'm now working on um, uh, a big hospital in the south of Mexico City, Medica Sur, um, where I'm giving this lecture from at this moment. Um, these are my, um, well, my links, my, my Twitter, my LinkedIn, and um, and if you have any more comments or questions, well, I shall be here to um, very happily respond or discuss with you whatever you'd like to, to, to tell me now. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think we did, did the right thing. We still some five, six minutes for questions or remarks, really um, always very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. That was a lot of uh, information. And I really like how you have all the data there that shows how effective it is. So thank you for uh, helping all the allergists out there know how to better treat all of their patients. So we have a few questions in the chat and let's take a look at those. So one says, which allergy test is best for determining allergies? And they might be referring to if it's a blood test or a skin, uh, the skin prick test. How about for people who test negative but still have reactions? What can they do? Yeah. Mm. Well, there's the, the skin prick testing that allergists do. No? So if you're not an allergist, then there's not even an option to have the blood test, to have the, the skin prick testing. I still see skin prick test as the, the most the, the most sensitive test 
Um, but uh, oftentimes it can be possible that there's quite some cross reactivity, which you are not able to uh, to diagnose in skin testing. As skin testing is done with uh, the whole allergen. So then there's the blood testing. In the blood testing, we have two different uh, types of blood testing. One is with the whole allergen. This is still the most sensitive test um, in the blood. Um, the other one is the the, the complement um, uh, diagnosis, now the molecular allergen diagnosis. And the good thing about uh, the molecular allergen diagnosis is what the name says. It's the molecules. Now, really, the, the, the different uh, major allergens that you are testing the blood, the serum of the patient, too. So you can see then that a patient um, respond, re, re, has a reaction, for example, to, um, yeah, to Flippy 5, but at the same time to uh, another uh, of the grasses and maybe even to some of the weeds uh, to with the flippy five is cross reacting sorry i have very highly expert mexican colleagues who just launched the molecular allergen diagnosis guideline uh, it's in spanish but there are the tables of which exactly cross react i don't know them by heart i always have this guideline here on my back when i'm working um but there's there are several um pan allergens that cross react not only within a family or within a species or, or a, a genus, but also within different families, because um, those are very conserved molecules in um, uh, in the world of the plants. So, so that you can pick up with molecular allergy diagnosis in the blood. The negative thing is it's quite expensive. Um, so I honestly, we have it here, um, but I only do it in patients who come up with a lot of positivity in skin testing. I say, wow, no, I think here really there's cross reactivity of pan allergens. And then we do the molecular uh, diagnosis to be able to pick the real allergen and the cross reactive ones. No. Thank you. That's it is quite the science to make sure that it's correct for each patient. So thank you for being so thorough. That's wonderful. Um, another question we have is what effect do these treatments have on a life expectancy, such as cancer rates and any infections? Yeah, that's very interesting. And, and I didn't show it because when we we did the contraindications now, because uh, all those slides I showed you from the, the survey, uh, in fact, it was about contraindications for allergen immunotherapy, and then on the other side, indications. No? <laughs> um, so then when we published, we also um, uh, looked very well at the literature on, on cancer and allergen immunotherapy, on autoimmunity and allergen immunotherapy. And then there was one quite long follow-up study that showed that on the long run, there was even a little bit less development of cancer and it was statistically significant um when patients got allergen immunotherapy as opposed to those who did not so if there is any signal it is a positive signal it is a preventive signal of allergen immunotherapy against cancer okay thank you thank you another question we have is doesn't age have a lot to do with improvement as the patient gets older yeah. Okay. And that's why you always need. Um, that's why you always need your control groups. Now, um, on the long run, allergen immunotherapy. Yeah, sure. There is this tendency. There's a, there's a huge placebo effect also linked to what you normally see, specifically during the first one one and a half year of allergen immunotherapy. That patients think that they get it, and in the double line placebo control trials, um, yeah, you can see that nice going down both of them, but then after one one and a half year, there's really the clear. A separation of those really getting allergen immunotherapy and those who did not. So, um, yeah, the best thing is, uh, yeah, that that's why a double blind disease control trial is always, uh, if you do it in small groups, I think the best solid evidence to to say, yeah, there there uh, there is this signal of the pure allergen immunotherapy, not the confounder of the placebo effect. But in those um, those long term uh, trials, there was really the difference between control group. And the active group, it was not only allergen immunotherapy, but I showed you. No, it was the difference in favor of the allergen immunotherapy group as opposed to the control groups. So, so um, yeah, that's the way you should read those, those uh, blots I showed you. Okay, thank you. Um, 
And then, um, oh, one, one question that we have on here is that sometimes people will have allergy shots when they're younger, when they're children, and later on as adults, they have to uh, repeat the sets of allergy shots. Is that, do you see that quite common? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'll stop sharing now if that's okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I always tell my patients, I am not changing your genes. No, so, so your tendency... Uh, genetic tendency to to react allergic to several allergens i'm not taking that away i'm only teaching your immune system during the allergen immunotherapy and luckily that's why it has to be three years two years is not enough three years so you really get your memory cells in there now we all know now that uh yeah it's the b memory in 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 the follicular uh, cells that are of importance um so this will hold on for several years but uh, your tendency to respond to several allergens with an allergic reaction i'm not taking that away so it is very well possible that after 10 15 years all of a sudden your allergies come back well come back to me, we do your testing again. And what generally has been shown that if you do a second round of allergen therapy, they even respond a little bit faster than in the first one. So it's not that uh, you won't get any good effect of it uh, anymore. No, on the contrary, you even respond a little bit faster. Good to know. Thank you. And before we started, I was sharing with you that all three of my kids who are adults now all had allergy yeah. shots when they were younger. And I worry, oh, are they going to have to repeat that later on? And I'm doing them like I am. So thank you. And yeah. wealth of information. Thank you. We are just over time. There are a couple more questions, but we're a little bit over time. So thank you again. Mexico is definitely lucky to have you and to have stolen you away. You're doing great things there. So our next webinar will be July 25th, which is back to school with food allergies. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. This will be recorded. It will be on our website within a few days. Also look for an email from Zoom that will have the uh, link to be able to view this as a recorded. Feel free to share it with anyone that you would like to. Um, and then thank you once again. This is Andrea Jensen for the staff of Allergy and Asthma Network. Join us as we work every day to breathe better together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Bye-bye.